Good morning. We'll be in Judges chapter 6 today, if you want to turn there in your Bibles. If you're new with us, we'd like to let you know what we're doing. We started a little while ago going through the Bible, beginning in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and we're working our way all the way through. Today we find ourselves in the middle of a mini-series that we're calling Heroes. And we're going to be talking about Gideon today. And Gideon, many people think of Gideon as the great general, the one that battled with only 300 men, the one that had to fight over 125,000 other soldiers with just 300 men. And we wonder, how did he get that way? How did he become what he was? And that's what we're going to talk about today. I like origins. When you look at superheroes, I used to collect comic books when I was a kid, and the origins were always neat. I always liked when the little guy, the underdog, would step up and become a hero. Spider-Man. How many of you know Spider-Man's real name? What is it? Peter Parker. Peter Parker started out as a little nerd and went on to become a high-flying hero. My favorite, though, we're going to see if you guys, we're going to test your superhero knowledge today. Steve Rogers. Anybody know? Captain America. Steve Rogers was the quintessential 100-pound weakling. He was so frail that even though the country was at war and trying to get as many soldiers as they could, they turned him away. But a doctor saw a fire burning inside of the small frame of Steve, and he ended up going on to become the very first superhero, which was Captain America. And he was my favorite. Now, that's just comic books, though, right? That's not even real, right? That's kind of fake. That's fantasy. That doesn't actually happen, does it? Trick question. I told you I'd let you know. Trick question. So, does that really happen today? Absolutely. Absolutely. Of course, it's not with a radioactive spider or a super soldier serum or something like that. It's far greater. God takes people, ordinary people like you and I, and does extraordinary things in his kingdom. He doesn't use supermen and superwomen, but ordinary people like us to do the extraordinary. Only instead of a radioactive spider, he uses something far greater a transforming element that is far superior. He uses his very own presence, the presence of God himself. And that's the story of Gideon. Gideon started out in the exact same way. And that's our story as well. Those of us who trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we go from being one thing transformed to being something far more than what we were. Gideon was an unlikely hero. And we're going to see that in a moment. And Gideon faced many of the same obstacles that you and I face. He faced these guys. These guys look familiar. Depression, disappointment, doubt, danger. It's all around us. No doubt every one of us has either faced every single one of these or at least has intimate knowledge of somebody who has. And I want to tell you that we're no different than Gideon. Gideon faced all four of these and many more. We're going to deal with these four today. So... You might even be here today. You might even be in one of these today. You may even be struggling with one of these right now. If you are, today is not an accident. You're not here by chance. Because that's exactly what we're going to be dealing with. These are the very elements that God uses to develop us, to turn us into the heroes that he wants us to be. That's what he used with Gideon. That's what he uses with us as well. And that's what we're going to be talking about here today. So let's take a look at Gideon's origin. We know we just ended with Deborah, and Deborah did some incredible things. Deborah led the nation of Israel for 40 years, and she was powerful, and she made a huge difference. And we called last week's sermon Girl Power, and I like that. She was incredible. And for 40 years, it says, Israel had peace. Israel was doing well. And then Deborah died, and Israel fell right back into the same old cycle. Let's take a look here in Judges chapter 6, beginning of verse 1. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. This is right after Deborah died. And the Lord gave them over to the hand of Midian seven years. So this is what happened. As long as Israel had a hero to follow, a human hero to follow, they were okay. As soon as that human hero went away, there was a problem. And they turned from him. They turned against him. 
And look at what happens. In verse 2, And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel, and because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves dens that are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. Basically, Israel goes running, and they hide in the rocks and in the caves. And they're so fearful, they went from being so powerful under Deborah, so incredibly strong under Deborah, now they're hiding in the rocks, terrified. And it gets worse. In verse 3, For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. So they would plant their crops and they would begin to grow and that's when the people would come in. That's when the enemies would come in. And they would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel and no sheep or ox or donkey. Israel's in bad shape. They'd go out there, they'd plant all that stuff, they'd start raising their animals, and then the enemy would come in and scare them away, and then the enemy would eat everything and take everything, all while Israel is hiding. They turned their backs on God. God allowed this to happen. And like so many of us, when things were bad, that's when they turned back toward God. When things were down and out, when it was a struggle, when they saw that there was no hope, then they turned to God. And they go through the cycle over and over again. This happened for seven years in a row. The enemy would come in and plunder land. And kind of woke them up. Because we see in chapter 6, verse 6, And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel, what did they do? They finally cried unto the Lord. Now, this is seven years later. Seven years of going through the same thing. Seven years of having their backs turned to God and seeing the result of that. We're coming to an election season here where we're beginning to vote in or vote out, however the case may be, leaders for our country. And we got to consider things like this. If we continue to walk as a people, not even as a government, but as a people away from God, we're going to be here. Actually, I kind of think we're here now, to be quite honest. That's just an opinion based on what I see around the world. I think we're kind of here now. Okay? And it's time to cry unto the Lord. And here's the problem with this. We wait until the last minute, the last resort. It's like, okay, we tried everything else. Oh, let's give God a shot. That's the cycle that we see going on in Israel. That's the cycle that we see in the mirror many times. I tried everything else. Uh, Okay, well, there's always God. Let's give him a shot. Let's see what he can do. It's not supposed to be like that, but that's what happens here. And this actually sets the stage for a hero. To step up because God, as always, answers the cry, answers the call, hears the voice of his people and raises up a hero, Gideon. And Gideon faced the four obstacles that we put up there. The same obstacles that you and I face. Depression, disappointment, doubt, and danger. We face that. And that's what he faced. And here's the thing that you've got to understand. God walked Gideon and Israel through these four stages, through these four opponents, through these four adversaries, these four enemies, to bring them to where he wanted them to be. And we're going to walk with them today because Gideon does become a great man. Gideon does become a great and mighty general and leads the people to many, many victories. But he had to start somewhere. And this is where he started. So if you can follow along in your notes there, Gideon first faces depression and discouragement. And the solution was he entered the presence of God. Enter the presence of God. How do you deal with depression? How do you deal with disappointment? Enter the presence of God. That's what we see here in Judges chapter 6, beginning of verse 11. There came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak tree that was in Ophrah that pertained unto Joash the Abazite. And his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, Thou mighty man of valor. Now, I want to paint a picture for you here. Threshing was done on the threshing floor, which was high up on the hill, where there was a lot of airflow, wind, out in the open, because what they would do is the farmer would take a shovel called a fan, and he would take the wheat, and he would throw the wheat up in the air, and the wheat and the chaff would separate. The wheat was heavier, so the wheat would fall, chaff would be blown to the side and then later they would take all that and then they would burn that stuff but the wheat was heavier and they needed a breeze to be able to blow that so it was always done up on a high hill 
on a flat platform. You get the picture? Okay. That's not where he was. That's called winnowing, by the way. The shovel was called a fan, and they would throw it up, and that was winnowing. It's something that they did for hundreds and hundreds of years, and it worked really well. You don't usually have to fix something that's working that well. But we do not find Gideon threshing up on top of the hill. Instead, we see him at the bottom of the hill because that's where the wine presses always were. The wine press was always at the lowest point in the land. It was usually in a shaded area. And we see Gideon doing it at the bottom, hiding behind the wine press. Why? He's in fear of the enemy. He's so down and out. He's got no place to live. He has no food. And what little he can scrape together. Remember, they came in and ate the produce of the land. So he's getting scraps that he's finding off the ground and bringing it over and trying to do what he can behind this well in fear and in trembling. And then God comes along and he sees something in Gideon that Gideon did not see in himself. And he actually calls Gideon a mighty man of valor, even though Gideon's hiding. Anyone that says God doesn't have a sense of humor has got to read this. Picture that. He's behind the wine press and he's throwing this stuff up a little bit to try to separate it. And here comes God says, the mighty man of valor, come out from hiding. (laughs) That's what happens here. But why is he there? He's there for fear. He's there because he's down and out. He's got no place to go. He's in a rough, rough place. No hope, no home, no nothing. For Gideon, there is no light at the end of the tunnel. He doesn't see it. He doesn't see the possibilities of coming out from this. He's been going through it year after year for seven years, trying to provide for his family, trying to take care of him in the face of an adversary. And he is down and out. He is depressed. He is discouraged. We see that in the verses that come up here. He is not in a good place. Many years ago, a young lawyer suffered from a similar state of depression, so much so that his friends hid the knives and the razors from him. This Midwestern lawyer was so down and out that they hid all the sharp objects from him. And this is what this man said. He said, I am now the most miserable man living. Whether I shall ever be better, I cannot tell. I awfully forebode, I shall not. Talk about down and out. Fortunately, eventually, Abraham Lincoln did come out of that dark place. That's the man that we're talking about. He did come out of that dark place and he was used in a great and powerful and mighty way. He didn't stay in that place. But he, in my opinion, opinion, Abraham Lincoln, one of the greatest leaders this country's ever seen. And he was in such a dark place that his friends had to hide all the sharp objects. But he came out. Many of you have been there or may even be there right now. How many of you ever heard of the preacher Spurgeon? Great 19th century preacher. Spurgeon was one of those guys, he spoke and people, their lives changed every time he did it. He was a powerful preacher, a powerful man of God. But what few people knew back then was Spurgeon spent his entire life in a state of deep, dark depression. So much so, this is how he described it. He described it as dungeons beneath the castle of despair. You ever been in a dungeon? You ever been in this kind of a place? A dungeon beneath a castle of despair? You ever been this down and out? Life is dark. You don't see any hope. Nothing. You have no energy, no enthusiasm, no joy, no nothing. And here's the problem with it. People that struggle with that are often looked down upon by others. When we had some of the greatest men and women in history battle with the same thing. Gideon battled with that. That's where he was. But then... Then something happened. Then something so exciting, so life-changing happened that Gideon came out of his darkness and became a great man. We see the presence of God piercing the darkness, piercing Gideon's darkness. He was so down and out. He was so miserable. I mean, think about it. Men, think about it. Your job's taken away. All the money's gone. All the food's gone. And you're scrapping up on the ground to try to feed your family. And there's no hope in sight. How down are we going to be about that? That's a tough place to be. If you've ever lost your job or if you've ever been without work, you know what that's like. It's a hard place. Moms, think about your children not having food or a place to even sleep at night. And you're in rocks and caves. It's a dark place. 
But the presence of God pierced the darkness. The angel of the Lord appeared. This is the same angel of the Lord that appeared to Hagar in the wilderness when she ran from Sarah. Okay? This is the same angel of the Lord that appeared to Moses in the burning bush when Moses was hiding in the backside of the desert and needed something. Needed something to liven him up. Needed something to push him. This is the same angel of the Lord that appeared unto Balaam on the road to disobedience when Balaam was walking away from God and God said, no, you will not do this. This is the same angel of the Lord that appeared unto Samson's parents when they could not have a child and they cried out to God. The angel of the Lord is none other than an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ himself. By the way, when Jesus shows up, when God shows up in physical form, it's in the form of Jesus Christ. When he shows up before that night in Bethlehem, we call it a theophany or a Christophany. Okay, it's just a physical appearance before that night in Bethlehem. A theophany, theo is God, phony is appearance of. Okay, a theophany or a Christophany. So whenever you see, and it's not every case when it says angel of the Lord. Sometimes they use a different word for Lord. Sometimes they use a different word for angel. But in many cases in the Old Testament, you see the angel of the Lord. You see people dropping down and paying homage and worshiping. No angel would ever accept that except for God himself. So here's a situation where God himself shows up in front of Gideon. And he pierces the darkness. Every case, by the way, that the angel of the Lord appeared and presented himself to somebody's life, whether it was Hagar, whether it was Samson's parents, whether it was Moses, any time he shows up, there was a massive and incredible life change. Read your Old Testament. Check it out. Whenever he shows up and intervenes in someone's life, a complete and total life change takes place. And that's what happens here. Now, I've talked with people who fight and battle with depression and disappointment. And they'll say, yeah, you know what? If God just showed up and showed himself to me, I'd feel that way too. I'd come out of it too. We got it better. My friends, we got it so much better. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 says this, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? We have it so much better today. Back then... They had to wait for the presence of God. Today, we dwell within the presence of God. And we have an opportunity to go to Him moment by moment, day by day. And have that darkness dissipate. And have that darkness go away. David had a taste of it. Check out what happens here. David, in 1 Samuel 16, 13. When Samuel anointed him king, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. Wow! Do you see that? From that day forward. You know what? This was such a life-changing thing for David. It was such a coveted thing for David, such a hungry thing for David, that he prays for it. In Psalm 51, verses 10 through 12, David says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Do you hear what's going on here? This is right after the deal with Bathsheba. And David is about as low as a man could possibly get. His child dies. His sin was revealed and he was wrong. And look at what happens here. He doesn't pray for it all to go away. He doesn't say, hey, Lord, how about we go back in time and erase it? Or, hey, Lord, can you bring my son back to life? Or, hey, Lord, can you take the looks out of the eyes of the people that I'm leading? Take it out of their eyes. No, he says, Lord, please. Please, Lord, don't take your presence away from me. Please, God, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. David was so down and out. He was so crushed. He was so broken. And the only thing that he wanted, the only thing he asked for, was the presence of God. Because he knew that was the only thing that was going to pierce the darkness that he was experiencing. He knew that was the only thing that was going to bring him out. He needed the joy of his salvation restored. You and I, when we face These dark times. You know what's going to get us out? Not the latest self-help book. Not Dr. Phil or Oprah. That stuff's not going to fix anything. You know what's going to fix you and me? You know what's going to get us out of this dark place? Is the presence of God himself. That's what's going to get us out. Gideon begins his journey of transformation here. Gideon is as low as you can get. And God shows up and all of a sudden things change. Everything changes. How many of you remember when you were a child 
and you were afraid of the dark. Were any of you afraid of the dark when you were a child? Do you remember that? Now, I'm not going to ask how many of you are afraid of the dark right now, because then we go down a whole different road. Okay? But I remember. I remember being a little boy, being in the room, and watching the movie that I shouldn't have watched, Count Dracula. Yes, it's true. My parents let me watch Count Dracula. The old, old one. But it was scary. And I told my dad, I said, Dad, he said, no, you're not going to watch this. You're going to have nightmares. I'm like, no, Dad, I'm tough. I think I was like five years old. I'm tough. I could picture Johnny saying, I'm tough. I can do it. And I watched it. And the whole time I'm watching, I'm like this. And that night, I went to bed, lights out. All of a sudden, Dracula showed up in my bedroom. He was there. He was there. And I was terrified terrified, shaking, and head, you know, under the blanket. And when I poked my head out, I thought I saw his hand come up on my bed. I was like, oh, no, terrified. And I cried out. I said, Dad. And I heard him in the next room. It's okay. I'm right here. All of a sudden, there were no problems. All of a sudden, Dracula took off because my dad was the toughest thing around. But what happened? I didn't get stronger. I didn't get braver. But I had somebody bigger next door. What's Gideon doing? Gideon is exposed to the presence of God who's greater than everything. My Bible says greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. There is no darkness that our God cannot pierce. There is no depression deep enough that our God cannot pull us by the hand and lead us through it and bring us out on the other side. There is no darkness that's that dark that could prevent my God from taking us out of this. He entered the presence of God of God. We, you and I, my friends, when we face it, we need to enter the presence of God. And then he goes on to the next stage here. Doubt and danger. Depression, discouragement, typically leads to these two other areas. And it does with Gideon. And Gideon takes refuge in the presence of God here. After God tells Gideon he's going to deliver Israel through him. Think about this. This is the guy hiding behind the wine press. And God says, I'm going to deliver my people through you, Gideon. Gideon kind of has his doubts, a lot of doubts, as he faces the danger ahead of him. And it says here in Judges chapter 6, verse 13, you can hear the depression, you can hear the discouragement, you can hear everything. Gideon said unto him, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be his miracles, which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us. And delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Wow. Talk about raw and honest. That's about as raw and honest as it gets. Lord, you say you're here. You say you're going to deliver us. Where have you been? You ever been there? You ever ask God that question? You ever been in such a state in your life? You look up, you say, I know you're here, Lord, but I don't see you. Where have you been? And you doubt and you question. And I know back in the day, people would say, oh, never question God. God can handle your questions and mine. He can handle our doubts. What he doesn't want you and I to do is walk away and never come back. But he knows there's going to be difficulties that you and I are going to struggle with. And he wants us to ask the question. He doesn't want us to check our brain at the door. He wants us to say, where are you? He's okay with our doubts. Gideon lays it on the line and asks God, if you are with us, why are we suffering? You ever wonder that? That thought ever cross your mind? God, if you're so great and you're with us, why is there so much suffering? It's a good question. It's an incredible question. You see, God was preparing Gideon to be the hero. He walked Gideon through the dungeons beneath the castle of despair. Now he's walking Gideon through doubt because Gideon needs to step up at some point. Gideon needs to be able to have these doubts answered. Gideon needs to get to a point where he's no longer in the state of depression. He's no longer doubting God because he's got so much danger he's going to face. And if he's in this state, he's not going to be the hero. He's going to fall like everyone else. So God walks him through this. He leads him through this. But it's not an easy walk at all because there's so much doubt. God says, I'm going to do it through you, Gideon. Trust me. Judges chapter 6, verse 15. He says unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? 
Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. What is he saying? He pulls a Moses on him. Gideon pulls a Moses right here. You would think he would know better. He knows the story. It wasn't that long ago. But he pulls a Moses. Lord, I'm the least of the least. Surely you could pick somebody greater, somebody better, somebody more powerful, somebody more fantastic, somebody more, somebody more than me. And God says, you have no clue what I'm about to do. And Gideon's like, but I'm just Peter Parker. That's all I am. I'm nobody. I'm small and weak. What could I possibly do to save your people? How many of you have ever felt that way? Think about that for a second. Some of you have been here for a while, and you know the message from this pulpit. You know what it is. You know what it's not, also. You know that it's not, hey, God wants to lavish you with money and stuff. He wants you to have it easy the rest of your life. No sickness, no pain. Just name it and claim it, baby. It'll be yours. You know that's not what comes from this pulpit. Why? Anybody know why that doesn't come from this pulpit? Anyone want to take a shot at it? It's not in this book. It's not in this book. I've looked for it. I wanted that. <laughs> I've looked and looked and looked. And nowhere does God say, hey, once you receive me as Lord and Savior, phew, golden roads. The golden roads are going to come. But not right now. That message, by the way, is warm and fuzzy and nice and cozy. It feels good. It's prevalent in the world today. We hear it all over the place. But the problem, a couple of problems. One, it's not in my Bible. But another problem is, and hear this, if my faith is a result of how good my life is, if my faith is a result of the physical blessings of God in my life, if my faith is a result of how good I feel, what's wrong with that? When things aren't good, and we are in a world where things are not good, and when I'm not feeling top of the mountain, what happens to my faith? Down the toilet. If my faith is based on me seeing, and that's what the people did. Remember when Jesus was in his earthly ministry? Remember, you know, he's speaking and he's preaching. And what do the people always ask for? Show us something. Feed us some more. Show us a sign. That's what he does. That's what Gideon did. Right? He said, where have you been? Our forefathers saw all these miracles. Where are they? (laughs) And God had to lead him through this because Gideon was about to face war. And war is not pretty. And war was going to challenge his faith like never before. God does not call us to be safe. He does not call us to be comfy. He calls us to be heroes, just as he called Gideon. God led Gideon through these doubts so that Gideon would be strong and secure and be able to lead others who would struggle with these doubts. You see, he was telling Gideon, it's not all about you, buddy. It's about me and what I want to do with my people. But in order for me to do that with my people, i got to get you out of this place, and I'm going to walk you through it. You notice he doesn't shoot him with a lightning bolt. Gideon doesn't get shot with a lightning bolt here. It's pretty neat. Does he deserve a lightning bolt here? (laughs) Sometimes, many times, I deserve a lightning bolt. It's fortunate that we don't have a God like the old fable of Zeus throwing lightning bolts down on people. He leads him through it. This book speaks of making an impact in the lives of others, a difference in this world, and for the kingdom of God. This book, my friends, clearly demonstrates that your life has eternal and infinite value in the hands of God, in the refuge of God. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Do you hear that? To give you an expected end. God has a plan. And you and I get to be a part of that plan. (laughs) Incredible. God has a bigger plan for our lives than allowing us to become, as they say, fat and happy. He wants us to be significant in his kingdom. He wants us to make a difference in the lives of others. He wants us to not be, woe is me, woe is me, all the time. He wants us to reach out and say, hey, let me help you, brother. Let me help you, sister. Let me do what I need to do. God, use me. 
You brought me through the depression. You brought me through the disappointments. You brought me through the doubts. The danger's here. Lord, use me to help others come out of this. That's what he's doing here with Gideon. That's what he wants to do with you and I. Now, you've heard me preach this before. How many of you have heard this message from this pulpit before that God has a plan for you? Anybody remember him? I hope somebody does. Okay, a couple. Good, good. But have you ever thought this, me, make a difference? Have you ever thought, I'm insignificant? Have you ever thought, what could God possibly do with me? Have you ever been so broken that you realize that you got nothing to offer an almighty, all-powerful, completely holy and pure God? You ever been there? I've met you there a few times, quite a few times. I wake up on Sunday morning and I think, okay, Lord, (laughs) there is no way I have a single word that a single person in this building could possibly use, but you have them all. You ever been there? What could I possibly do? You ever thought, I'm just an ordinary person? Why would God want to do the extraordinary through me? You ever been there? Chances are you have. Samuel wondered that when a dirty little shepherd boy was brought to him to be anointed king. And God straightened him out this way. Take a look at what God says here. The Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his appearance or on the height of his stature. He was a little boy. We don't know exactly how old he was. Some people say that he was under 12 because he was still called a boy. Some people think he was a little bit older, 13, 14. In either case, he was just a little guy. He says, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. You may look in the mirror and only see you looking back at you. But God sees a whole lot deeper. He sees your heart. He knows whether or not it belongs to him. C.S. Lewis said it best when he wrote, there are no ordinary people. You've never met a mere mortal. How many of you ever remember hearing that, reading C.S. Lewis stuff? You want to know where he got that from? Let me show you where he got that from. But to all who did receive him, who believed on his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Whoa. You know something? I cannot help but get amped up about this. We literally become the children of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Do you realize what that means? We go from being peasants that have no value that can add nothing to the world, to children of the Most High God, who through Him can change the world. Can you wrap your mind around that for a second? You can call God Father. Wow. Oh my goodness. If that doesn't fire you up, check your pulse. You might not be alive right now. Seriously. Brian, I'm a child of God. I'm going to heaven someday. What about you? What does that do to you, Brian? My goodness. I no longer have to walk around. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. That's all I am. Hey, Sean, I'm just a nobody. I am a nobody for crying out loud. But God has infused me. God has let me be a partaker of His divine nature. And now I'm His child. I'm His son. And no, I'm not going to be proud of me. But I can be proud of Daddy. I can be proud of what He's going to do how he's going to move in me and how he's going to change the world and I can give glory to him walking around like this down and out about who you are you know, down and out about you know, I'm just humble let me tell everybody just how humble I am I'm the most humble person there is I'm the best there is at being humble there's a little problem there you know, there's a little bit of an oxymoron there I'm supposed to let my light so shine before men that they see my good works and glorify who? My Father who's in heaven. Am I letting my light shine through by... uh, I'm worthless. I don't have to tell anybody that for them to know that. I'm just like you. You're just like me. But we have been made partakers of the divine nature. We must, as children of the Most High God, take refuge in His presence and dwell there and live there. And not just when things get bad. We need to dwell there and live there. We need to take refuge there. We must. Especially during times of doubt 
and danger. Natural disasters, school shootings, a failed economy, sickness, war. It's a dangerous thing to be a human being in this world today, isn't it? Wouldn't you say? We're an endangered species, believe it or not. You say, yeah, but Pastor, there's 7 billion of us on the planet. That's nothing compared to how many numbers of other creatures that we share the planet with. We are an endangered species. We have an election coming up, and people are wondering, what's going to happen to our country over the next four years? Scientists are predicting a super flu pandemic that in the near future that's going to rival the Black Death that took 25 million lives in the Middle Ages. Terrorists plot our destruction. Many foreign governments hate us. Nuclear weapons technology in the hands of our enemies. It's a dangerous world. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Are we going to roll up, crawl up in a ball at the face of danger? If so, we better get home now because danger is all around us. Gideon went on to take 300 men with him to defeat over 125,000 soldiers. What did he do as he was walking through this, as he was walking through the depression and the disappointment, the doubt and the danger, what did he do? He practiced the presence of God. He dwelt in the presence of God. Whenever we think about courage, whenever we think about, especially this particular time, he had 300 men. We think about Leonidas, the king of Sparta. He was in 480 B.C. He was about to fight the Persian army. The Persian army had an innumerable number of warriors. Innumerable. As a matter of fact, an envoy came up and said to Leonidas, he said, hey, you want to get out of the way. As the king's army comes through here, the ground was shaking. He said, you need to get out of here because this is what he said about the size of this army and the futility of Leonidas. He said, our archers are so numerous that the flight of their arrows darken the sun. You know what Leonidas said? He said, so much the better. For we shall then fight them in the shade. <laughs> Guys, give me a... <laughs> come on, men. Uh, come on, lady. Ladies, you can do this too because... Remember, Deborah? Come on, ladies. Let me hear you ladies do it. Go ahead. Okay. Not ladylike, I understand. Okay. What do we do when we're facing these doubts and these dangers? Psalm 23, 4. Yea, though I've walked through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. The presence of God can pierce the darkness. Gideon found the answer. He found the answer. And it says here in verse 16, And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee. <laughs> oh, you and I face these things, these enemies. The only way to come out on top is to enter the presence of God and take refuge in His presence. Let me close with this. There was a study done. In the day America told the truth. Okay, some of you have read that. Researchers Jane Patterson and Peter Kim found that 70% of Americans say they have no living heroes. 70% of Americans claim they have no living heroes. That's tragic. Because God has you for such a time as this. God wants you and I. It's of absolute necessity for us to step up in the presence of God and be the heroes that God wants us to be. Let's pray. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, my Bible is so very clear. God wants to work a work in and through you and I to change lives, to impact lives, to make a difference in this world. We cannot do it on our own. We cannot do it by ourselves. We cannot do it on our own strength. If we try, we will fail. But if we enter the presence of God, take refuge in the presence of God, practice the presence of God, live and move and dwell in the presence of God, and let Him do what He does best. Let Him be the hero of our story. Guess what? Life changes. Destinies change. Heroes are born and leave legacies to their king for eternity to come. Maybe you stepped in here today. Maybe you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe you came in here today and you don't know Him as Lord and Savior. Maybe you came in here today and you don't know you have heaven. Oh, maybe you thought you did. 
Maybe you have the idea that, well, if I'm a good enough person, I get to go to heaven someday. You know, something that's not in my Bible. My Bible says it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done. It's by faith in Jesus Christ. It's by His grace. It's by the work done by Him on the cross and in the empty tomb. It's the fact that Jesus Christ went to the cross and paid the price for your sins and mine and then rose again, the greatest hero of the greatest story ever told. That's how we get to heaven. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes into the Father but by me. See, Jesus made it very, very clear. Yes, I am the hero of the story. And as you enter into my presence, into a relationship with me, I usher you in to heaven. It's not being a good person. It's not going to church. It's not doing a bunch of good things. Those things are nice and fine. But they do not get you and I to heaven. One thing gets you and I to heaven. When you and I appear before those gates, before the gates of heaven, you know what gets us in there? The presence of God in your heart and in mine. That is the only thing that gets you and I into heaven. And if you have not received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, what in the world does that mean? That means placing your faith, your trust, your hope in the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. If you have not done that, my friend, you are in incredible danger. You are in eternal and infinite danger right now because there is a place called hell. There is a place called hell. And I wouldn't wish my worst enemy there because there is no escape. That darkness lasts forever. Right now, you can call upon the name of the Lord. If you haven't done so yet, please do not take another second living outside of God's presence. Right now, I'm going to pray a prayer. Not magical. It's the intents of your heart. And you could pray it with me. But it's got to be genuine. It's got to be from you. It can't be just something that you mimic. Because as he said to Samuel, God looks at the heart. So right now, right where you are, quiet with yourself, you could say something like this. You could say, Lord, I want you. I need you. I want a home in heaven. I know I have sinned and I am sorry. And now you can say this, Lord, I turn from that. I abandon that. And I turn to you. And as best as I know how, I place my faith, my hope, and my trust in your risen son. Everyone's heads bowed. Everyone's eyes are closed. My friend, if you pray that prayer and you meant it from the depths of who you are, my Bible says you're a new creature. My Bible says you have a home in heaven that can never be taken away. You didn't earn heaven. So you can't be good enough to keep it. It's God's presence that keeps it for you. And if you pray that prayer with me, I so much want to pray for you right now. I'm not going to make you jump up and down or come up here in front. But I want to pray for you. I want to keep you in my prayers this week. If you just pray that prayer with me, could you do me a huge favor? No one else is looking around, just myself. If you just pray that prayer with me, could you lift up your hand right where you are? I want to keep you in my prayers this week. Amen. Praise God. Anyone else? You just called upon the name of the Lord. You you stopped doing it in your own strength and you cried out to the living God. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you so much. We thank you. Father, you are incredible. And even that word is way too small. You are amazing. And even that word is far too small. You are infinite and eternal and that doesn't even begin to capture who you are. You are all-powerful, all-knowing. Still, Lord, We're scratching the surface. You're sovereign. And we don't even comprehend that. But we thank you so much for your presence here today. I thank you for those that have called upon your name. I thank you, Lord, for piercing the darkness and leading us to you. I ask that you would lay your hand of blessing upon each and every person here today. We love you, Lord. Help us to dwell in your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.